thank you very much. And thank you so much for uh, inviting me to talk about the thing that has interested me the most. Uh, I started measuring the epithelium before I did my residency. Uh, I obviously have uh, some financial interests in this, which are in the program in detail. And this is the references in the syllabus. I've written a, uh, a summary of the talk uh, in detail. You'll see that most of the talks, uh, most of the references are mine, but then uh, epithelium has not really been possible to be measured until recently uh, from a commercial device. In fact, the first person that measured the epithelium was Brian Holden uh, and published a paper using optical pachymetry uh, in 1979. I started doing this uh, in a pre-residency fellowship and we published uh, the ability to measure epithelium with one micron precision with high frequency ultrasound, uh, mapped it a few years later uh, to a three millimeter zone and managed to build a prototype that could map the epithelium in 10 millimeter area with one micron precision as well as the stroma and other intramolar layers within the Uh, Confocal microscopy has also been used, but of course, as you know, the window of uh, the diameter window is is quite small, uh, and OCT has also now been developed in order to be able to measure epithelial thickness. And uh, as you know, there's a commercially available device uh, called the RT View, uh, which which measures epithelial thickness out to about six millimeters, hopefully will be expanded in the future. So let's talk about uh, what the epithelium actually is in the normal cornea. And we published this uh, series of 110 normal eyes. And we were surprised to find that there was a distinctly uh, uh, uneven pattern in the epithelium and that it was very symmetrically asymmetric uh, between right and left eyes. The central thickness is 53 microns. The standard deviation is very tight at about 2 microns. But there's a north to south difference of about uh, 6 microns and an east to west difference of about a micron. How does this happen? Well, we need to think about the eyelid anatomy because, as you know, the semi-rigid tarsus is providing a template for the outside of the cornea. And you need to ask yourself, how is it that refraction can remain stable despite the fact that the epithelium turns over every seven days, and yet our refraction, the the curvature of the cornea, which determines whether we can see or not, stays to less than 0.1 millimeters radius constantly throughout our entire life, pretty much. So the blinking action, of course, is an inward force, and as Newton taught us, all forces in an equilibrium system must be equal. And so the postulate is, of course, that the epithelium grows out as an outward growing force, and the eyelid and the chafing of the wing cells as, as they grow out is the inward force. And we have eight hours of sleep and 10,000 10, blinks while we're awake. But if we replace the eyelid with another kind of template, like an ortho lens, we find that we can redistribute the epithelium such that the center of the, of, of the epithelium becomes thinner and causes a myopic correction, a hyperopic shift. In fact, in a decentered ortho K lens, you see exactly the same thing as predicted. Alfred Vogt in 21 in his textbook said that corneal stromal defects are filled with surface epithelial defect, uh, cells. And in fact, Barraquer started creating uh, stromal defects and we started continuing his work in the 90s with an eczema laser. And there were three of us who were interested in measuring epithelium at the time, and we showed that the epithelium was thickening in the center of the cornea after myopic ablation. The whole story, however, was that the change in epithelium was lenticular. In other words, it was thicker in the center, but it progressively thinner towards the periphery, and therefore the epithelium itself was a contact lens sitting on the stroma reversing the effect of the ablation. When we looked at the stromal thickness, we found that the stroma, of course, thinned in the center, but it thickened outside of the ablation zone. And there was compensatory epithelial thinning around the zone where the stroma had steepened. And, of course, the amount of thickening was proportional to the amount taken out. When we look at epithelial changes longitudinally, one day, one month, three months, up to a year, and we look at difference maps between these time points, we see that most of the change occurs overnight, and that the rest of it occurs in the first month, and by three months there is little to no epithelial changes whatsoever. Interestingly, the same pattern of epithelial change occurs after RK, 
with thickening in the center and progressive thinning towards the periphery. But RK does not involve any removal of tissue. It only involves changing the curvature. And of course, this change we found to be permanent. This, this is a publication showing RKIs up to 26 years after surgery. So whatever this change is, it becomes permanent. Another example of how curvature changes affect epithelial thickness was when we looked at keratoconus. And we described this donut pattern where the epithelium becomes thinner over the protrusion on the stromal surface and thicker in a ring structure around the cone. And in fact, as the keratoconus becomes progressively more severe, the thinnest point of the epithelium becomes thinner and the thickest point becomes thicker. This difference between normals and keratoconics was something that we thought of exploiting for diagnosing keratoconus earlier than is possible by topography because you may have a completely regularized corneal surface despite the fact that below the surface there are small subsurface cones that can be one or two microns in difference in epithelial thickness but not yet distorting the, the, the topography so giving you false negatives when you're screening patients for, uh, for surgery. Likewise, our machines have algorithms that detect keratoconus for us, and it's very hard to do a surgery on a patient whose chart has suspect keratoconus written in red. But if you have an epithelial thickness map, you can prove that there is no thinning over the area of steepening and do surgery on these patients. In our published series of 1,500 consecutive eyes screened, 83% were not keratoconic, received LASIK, which of course increased our surgical volume over the last 10 years by 7%. And we found that these patients were stable at one year, including vector analysis compared to controls. In fact, stable out to five years now, which we're hoping to publish soon. So this goes to some rules of epithelial healing. Epithelium thickens to fill depressions. Epithelium thins over peaks. Epithelial change is proportional to the stromal change. More myopic ablation, more change. More keratoconic progression, more change. More hyperopic ablation. The thinnest point becomes thinner, the thickest point becomes thicker. The amount of change is defined by the rate of curvature change of the stromal surface. So for example, in a corneal ulcer here, uh, uh, one millimeter wide, but 200 microns deep, there's almost full compensation by the epithelium. If you make the same 200 micron uh, uh, um, remo tissue removal, but in a larger zone, as we were doing in the early 90s with PRK, you get a lot of regression. And that's what was observed. And David O'Brien did some very elegant work in John Marshall's group, showing that as you increase the optical zone, so you decrease the amount of regression, which was, of course was epithelial. This brings us to uh, starting to understand how irregular astigmatism affects the epithelium. And here's a case of a short flap where there is very thick epithelium at just at the point where there was double ablation under the flap and in the bed. RK, multiple lamellar procedures with multiple zones, and a decentered hyperopic ablation. So the law of epithelial compensation, as we say, is irregular astigmatism irregular epithelium. If a cornea presents with irregular topography, by definition, the epithelium has reached its maximum compensatory function, which therefore means that topography and wavefront guided measurements are inaccurate means of describing the irregularity on the stromal surface and therefore not great at helping us repair these eyes. You can have the same outer surface and completely different stromal surfaces. So let's look at how this worked in this case of irregular astigmatism, where we, we compared in this publication the topography-guided profile with a transepithelial profile, and found that the transepithelial was much more likely to take out the bump, because there was no distortion of where the surface really was um, uh, affected. And if you look at this short video, we see how the transepithelial PTK down to 49 microns gave us exactly the breakthrough pattern that we would have predicted digitally with breakthrough here and here. And of course, this eye with a big divot here and irregular astigmatism ended up completely smooth. The epithelium was regularized, the topo topography was regularized, the staining pattern was regularized, and the patient's vision uh, no longer had uh, ghosting. 
So the future of repair work is to take the corneal topography, remove the epithelial thickness from it to get a stromal topography, and to feed that into an eczema laser so that we can repair any irregular surface. In fact, in September of 2000, we did a case of these um, with Gerhard Yusefi using the 217 Topolink software. We provided him with a highly irregular cornea and an epithelial profile. He calculated the corrected ablation profile. We did the procedure. The cornea was highly improved. The patient uh, did not require any further surgery. So the importance of understanding epithelium in corneal refractive surgery, I, th I, I hope you, uh, you will agree, is, is unequivocal. Mainly, it'll stop us from doing surgery on the wrong patients. Of course, help us do surgery on patients who we would have avoided for the wrong reason. It'll help us do repairs in irregular situations where topography-guided or wavefront-guided procedures will not be of help. Of course, it might improve the accuracy of refractive surgery itself, but I think most importantly, it will change the perception of refractive surgery that the public has. If you think that only 1% of potential candidates have had surgery 20 years after this procedure has become popularized, that means three standard deviations of patients are not having it. So the 1% are the crazies, and the others are the normals. And I believe, truly, that it's because of the issue that if something goes wrong, there's nothing that can be done is still out there. And I believe that the epithelium and understanding it and measuring it in all of our patients is the key to blowing a hole in this problem. Thank you very much. Should I just walk off? <laughs> Am I taking questions? <laughs> Can I play the saxophone? Did, is, can I ask one question? So, it, is anybody here, was anybody here present at the New Orleans AAO about 10 years ago when I played the saxophone with Charlie Kelman at the Royal Sinesta Hotel and took a picture of me? You're from South America. You said you'd send me the picture. You never sent it. I'm dying to get that picture. Thank you. Absolutely, <laughs> 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 Yeah, that was just amazing. Thank you. <laughs>